Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Insightful Thinkers podcast. Today, um, we're talking about feminism. We're going to trace the history of feminism from antiquity to present day. Not really quite to present day because um, the feminist movement has kind of um, become a little less kind of uh, focused in terms of specific issues in, in recent times. So you can't really trace exactly kind of what wave we're in now kind of thing. But um, we'll, we'll trace the entire history today and um, we'll, we'll get pretty close to present day. So feminism in antiquity there's really not much we know about it. The earliest known texts from ancient Greece and Rome are texts of patriarchal societies. A patriarchy is a system of society of government in which men hold the power over women and women are excluded from society. So any philosophical ideas or opinions women had about their role in society in antiquity are are really unknown because these were every idea was was from the mind of a uh, man, every written idea um, and every idea from women was not able to be published um, because men did dominate society. So um, the ideas of women, uh, though they may have um, been concerned about their place in society at the time, they they remain unknown. There does seem, though, to be somewhat of a broader discussion of the role of women in society starting in the second and third centuries uh, CE. So some of the texts from the philosophical school of Gnosticism elaborate the idea of an ungendered spirituality and knowledge that women can attain to, but only if they become like men. So basically women, according to in Gnosticism, or some texts, they can only achieve a level of spirituality if they become like men. So as you can see here, this is not ideal. And this is just very much kind of um, uh, b really just baby steps um, starting early on and a long time before real progress would be made still. Let's take us to the Middle Ages now. And one of the main feminist influences of the Middle Ages is Teresa of Avila, uh, born in 1515 and died in 1582. She drew up her own rules for the monasteries she founded. She believed that the orders and law that was established by and designed for men were not suitable for women. An inquisitorial proceeding was initiated against her um, after kind of, obviously this is going against society. If, if women sp spoke up at that time, they would... Um, be uh, castigated pretty much. So this proceeding was initiated against her, but eventually the church did recognize her doctrines as orthodox and actually declared Teresa a saint in 1622. So she was probably the biggest influence in the Middle Ages, and she started to bring up these ideas of women's role in society. We come to early modern feminism now, and this really was um, led by a couple people. The first one is the French philosopher and writer Christine de Pizan, 1365 to 1430. Um, so the, actually, this is, this is within the Middle Ages kind of thing. So um, she wrote the book of the City of Ladies in 1405. This attacked the popular notion that women have fewer aptitudes and are less capable than men. She says this, she says, they who defame women are small spirits. They've encountered so many women ranking far above them in terms of wisdom and gentility that their reaction is to be sulky and indignant. And because of this grudge, they speak ill of all women. So she's kind of bringing up this almost insecurity in a way from men that causes them to denigrate women and to kind of, and to try to suppress them because they see women who may be smarter and may rank far above them in terms of wisdom and gentility. She says they, tr they hold a grudge and then speak ill of all women. Um, we also have the French philosopher Marie de Gournay, 1565 to 1645. She wrote the equality of men and women in 1622. And this is one of the earliest examples of modern equal rights discourse. Um, and it was really, um, by the way, these are not, um, obviously this is not just my, all my individual research. This is, um, from the book. Let me get the uh, authors actually. So you guys can have a further reading if you want to delve into this, because this is where I got most of this information from. This is a book by, um, 
I believe the author's name. Let's see here. Patu and Shrup, A Brief History of Feminism, translated by Sophie Lewis. That will that's the further reading on this topic, and that's where that's the main source uh, for this episode. So um, she says this in the text: Marie de Gournay in the Equality of Men and Women. Um, biological sex differences do not account for the spirit of a human being. A logical consequence is the right of women to be human. The human spirit is neither masculine nor feminine. So she's really the first to argue about for equal rights, um, because women (laughs) for basically all of history have not been seen as equals. And this text in 1622 is one of the main influences uh, to start the discussion about equal rights for men and women. We come to the Enlightenment now, uh, closer to the 1700s, and this is where we see the teacher and the writer Mary Wollenscraft, or excuse me, Wollstonecraft. She wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Women. She is one of the first to criticize the fact that women were raised and socialized to be dependents, and they are not uh, naturally born as, as dependents or inferior, but it's the socialization process and it's society that makes them this way. She, um, she argued that the existing differences between men and women don't have natural causes, but are produced instead by society. Uh, very influential for the time as well. In early socialist feminism, uh, what is very interesting is that most of the socialist theories perpetuated by both men and women explicitly addressed the question of the relation between the sexes. Um, in socialism, there's more of this, these ideas about uh, the communal order and how everyone is going to kind of coexist. And because of that, they needed to discuss the place of women in society. Um, the sociologist Henri de Saint-Simon said, the new world will be governed by a papal couple. The female pope will represent emotion and the male pope reason. It's the only way a peaceful society can rise. Man must liberate women and women must be represented in all public offices. These are things that we all agree on. Gender specific characteristics are not in fact given by nature, but rather are attributable to unequal socialization. So this is similar to what um, Wollstonecraft was saying about how these gender roles are not uh, given to you when you're born just because you're a woman you are you are lower than a man no this is because of the socialization process and because of uh, the role society is is given women and what they say women can and can't do and this really builds on um, the ideas from the enlightenment of wollstonecraft um, about how there's nothing uh inferior about women from birth. It's just about the way that uh, we have negatively um, kind of created their role in society. And and the patriarchal societies dominated by men have have denigrated them throughout the years. Um, And these, they kind of continued to build on these ideas. And we started to see the beginning of a real organized women's movement. Um, Because really up until the middle of the 19th century, There hadn't been anything like an organized movement. As you can see, there's been the philosophers, the writers who have said things and written books here and there, but there was no movement, no cohesive thing to really make some some real changes here. And this is where we we get into the United States feminism um, that maybe you guys are a little bit more familiar with. So U.S. feminists... Lucrezia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, they organized the two-day Seneca Falls Convention in New York in 1848. This was one of the biggest days for feminism in history. And and this is in the, the middle of the 19th century, the first real organized movement for feminism. At the end of the convention, a declaration of rights and sentiments was adopted, revoking all claims to power over women. So, you see some real change starting to happen rather than just these, uh, these, these texts written and these ideas perpetuated by philosophers. Real change is starting to happen. Three topical concerns preoccupied the emerging women's unions and women's groups of that era. So the first one was the demand for better access to paid work. 
Um, the second was the critique of traditional households and the injustice of forced marriage. And the third was the demand for universal suffrage, which is the right to vote. Obviously, women did not have the right to vote at this stage in the middle of the 19th century. At the U.S. Women's Rights Convention, a little bit after that first two-day convention, um, the preacher and former slave Sojourner Truth gave one of the most impressive speeches um, really one of the most impressive feminist speeches of all time. Um, and it called Ain't I a Woman? So I'm going to read some of the text here. This speech, it was transcribed by different people, and we don't actually know the exact wording of the speech, but this seems to be the most agreed upon wording. And this is uh, really one of the most powerful feminist speeches of all time, really, by Sojourner Truth. And this is really what uh, a big thing that has made Sojourner Truth go down in history. She says, that man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen most all sold off to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, no one but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? If the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. And now the key is asking to do it and men better let them. This is just such a powerful speech. Um, really talking about how men, okay, so really what, was, what she was arguing against was positive discrimination. This was the sentiment in the day. This was the idea that it's, it's in the women's own best interest to allow herself to be of second class to the man because they're weaker and they need a man. They need a man to support them. But Sojourner Truth says, hey, when you guys took my children away into slavery, when you guys, um, when I've been whipped and when I've had to work and these things, I didn't see you guys helping me. So why is it that you don't want to help me in my toughest times, but then you want to make this overarching claim that, oh yeah, women women need to be helped. Women are weaker than men. I'm strong just like you. I can eat just as much as you if you let me. I, I've born 13 children. I'm strong. And it's just so powerful just to say that she's been able to do it alone and no no man has been able to help her. So uh, the, only, the only one hearing her cries when her children were sold into slavery was Jesus, she says. So um, don't act as if I need you and you haven't been helping me when men haven't been helping me my whole life. So this was very powerful. So you can see in these the mid 19th century, there's a real change starting to happen. The sentiment is starting to change. And um, really one of the greatest feminist speeches ever by Sojourner Truth. This takes us into the women's wage labor movement. So this, what was happening here was the, the question of access to adequately paid and respectable opportunities for wage labor. This is what occupied a central position in almost all feminist activities during these years. Um, this is kind of uh, just a little bit later, I believe like in the 1860s or a little bit after. In the women's wage labor movement, feminists rejected the so-called women's protection laws that legally prohibited women from working certain jobs on account of their supposedly fragile physical constitution. So this was this positive discrimination that permeated American society that, um, oh, women are fragile. They can't work these hard jobs. A man needs to do it. Um, kind of this this guise of almost protecting women, but in reality, they were just keeping them suppressed in a way. The journalist and feminist Louise Otto Peters launched the women's newspaper in 1849. She founded the Workers and the Servants Unions and published her book, Women's Right to Earn a Living in 1866. Together with others, Otto Peters organized the first German women's conference in Leipzig in 1865. She directed the General German Women's Union for three decades after that, which offered advanced training courses for women, among other things. So this is uh, in Germany. So in the middle of the 19th century, it wasn't just happening in the United States. It was also happening in Europe as well. This 
also was happening in in the United Kingdom, where Harriet Taylor Mill and her daughter Helen Taylor um, had some ideas about uh, kind of women's wage labor as well. So together with the political theorist and philosopher John Stuart Mill, as many of you guys may be familiar with, John Stuart Mill, so this is um, the the husband of Harriet Taylor Mill and then the stepfather of Helen Taylor. Uh, they authored numerous texts on economics as well on suffrage rights and divorce rights. So their approach to capitalism was utilitarian and oriented towards the greater good and of the greater good of the greatest number. So they were really trying to um, establish policies that were going to benefit not just men, but women, and not just men and women, but the most amount of men and women possible, the greatest good of the greatest number. The text of the subjection of women was published but appeared solely under John Stuart Mill's name. And this was so that the women could gain more recognition um, and attention towards their ideas. Because if they published it under female names, this text would would maybe be lost in history. So by publishing it under uh, John Stuart Mill's name, they attracted a lot more attention to their to their uh, ideas. They say, the legal subordination of one sex to the other is wrong in itself. And now one of the chief hindrances to human improvement. So you really see the sentiment starting to change here. We also have the free love uh, debate and the critique of marriage that was happening in the 19th century. This was one of the crucial themes in, in this century, and it was the plight of wives. In most European countries, marriage meant a mass transfer of entitlements from bride to groom, and married women really practically lost all their rights. So marriage was really just to benefit men. And it just allowed all of uh, women's rights to be to be passed over to their husband. The U.S. feminist and socialist Victoria Woodhull, she demanded women's right to sexual autonomy. Uh, this is that this free love idea that, hey, I can do whatever with whoever I want. I don't need to be uh, locked in to a man and give up all my rights just to be able to have sex really and and to love. She's a, she says, I'm a free lover. I have an inalienable constitutional and natural rights to love whom I may, to love as long or as short as a period as I can, to change that love every day if I please. And with that right, neither you nor any law you can frame can have, have any right to interfere. Um, there was much debate, though, over this idea of free love, the sexual autonomy idea, and there were three camps, really. There were the radicals. The radicals demanded a new sexual moral order and a social status for women that is entirely unrelated to marriage. So this would fit a little more closely with Victoria Woodhull's ideas, that you can just you should be able to just love freely, um, to love for as long or as short a period as you want, and things like this. The moderates... They kind of agreed with Woodhull's ideas or, or the radicals, but they said, we're certainly also for the abolition of forced marriages and unjust laws, but we hold women's social role as a mother to be very important still. The aims of feminist emancipation must have their limits. So they almost wanted to temper down the ideas of the radicals that women should just be totally free. They said women should still be able to embody their role as a mother and things like this. Whereas the conservatives, they said, we want to valorize the housewife's vocation and have no fundamental criticisms of the marital system. So they, um, their ideas were basically in line with, with the marital system and they felt, okay, it's okay. The housewife is the vocation of the wife. This is the role that the wife should assume. And um, they had no disagreements with the, the present system. In the... This takes us to the first wave of feminism. So this is where we're really starting to get organized here, <clears throat> especially in the United States. This is the what the women what the women focused on in the first wave of feminism was the women's right to vote and party politics. After the end of the Civil War in 1869, suffrage rights were introduced for black men but not for women, and many feminists welcomed this change. But they considered it an important step, and they did consider it an important step for the black population. But 
On the other hand, radical women's rights advocates like Susan B. Anthony or Elizabeth Cady Stanton were indignant because they now saw women's suffrage as being deprioritized. So they really weren't all for this idea that black the black men were able to get the vote and, and the women weren't. Um, and rightfully so, but they really had a radical approach to this. And unfortunately, they actually did... Um, show some racism towards the idea that black people were given the vote. Anthony, before before women, Anthony says, if you will not give the whole loaf of suffrage to the entire people, give it to the most intelligent first. If intelligence, justice, and morality are to have precedence in the government, let the question of women be brought up first, and then that of the Negro last. So they were very radical in making change, as you need to be as a as a as an influencer for any type of change but anthony susan b anthony really wanted that women's vote even before uh, any black people got the vote so there was a little bit of of friction there and we're not going to really get into all the details there was a little bit of friction between uh, frederick Douglass, one of the um i don't even know how to describe one of the greatest really black men of all time philosopher activist uh writer former slave all sorts of these things just uh, a real activist for change and he originally was aligned with anthony but there they started to uh split off because of these disagreements with with douglas kind of wanting the or all for the black vote being awarded whereas anthony was was not for this as you can see her partner elizabeth Cady stanton also showed some of this racism when she said a serious there's a serious question whether we had better stand aside and see sambo walk into the kingdom of civil rights first before the woman sambo is a derogatory term used to describe african americans so the radical feminists of the time and still some of the most influential feminists ever um, really were against the the black, or in this case, she uses a derogatory term to refer to African-Americans. They were really against the black vote being given before the women vote. This takes us to the women's empowerment movement, uh, led by really the French philosopher Simone de Beauvoir, born 1908 and died in 1986. She demanded that women be liberated from their social role as mothers. She called on women to put more energy into their professional or political careers and to take steps to ensure that gender differences would disappear from society. Trying to still really trying to break down the walls that have been built up by the patriarchal society to make women second class citizens. Um, and let's break off from our, our role as a mother and let's start to develop um, <clears throat> put more energy into our professional professional or political careers. The autonomous women's movement now, this is what it started the second wave of feminism in the 1970s. Uh, so getting a little bit more recent now and, and very organized movements here. So there were three main battlegrounds that became particularly important during this time. So one was claiming bodily integrity as a fundamental right. And this was so the importance of personal autonomy, self-ownership, self-determination of human beings over their own bodies. So this applies to um, like the right to have abortions and free love. We have the right to our own bodies. And up until the 1970s, uh, women r really didn't. And, and it's really, or in the United States, some women still do not in the world today, but or many, I should say. Um, and they also wanted to revolutionize parenting, housework, and domestic labor. And they wanted to expose the scandal of epidemic sexual violence in society. So rape, sexual assault, and things like this. So they wanted to kind of highlight what was, what's been happening to women uh, for <laughs> forever, really, and, and bring it to light. So these were the three main pillars of the second wave of feminism, the autonomous women's movements. Autonomous in the name autonomous women's movement refers to the fact that feminists no longer felt committed to their organizations, parties, or religious denominations, but turned instead um, toward organizing simply as women. Um, this may have planted the seeds for the feminist movement to become a little more 
kind of like dispersed and and they didn't really want to make these organizations and things like this starting in the second wave of feminism the practice of separatism which is this um these autonomous movements in the 1970s led to a groundswell of women's groups women's bookstores and women's cafes all across the united states it was u.s feminists who invented consciousness raising that still exists today where women would speak amongst themselves, sharing their experiences with each other and reflecting on them politically. Women's groups in many other countries as well adopted this practice of women starting to come together, not necessarily in an organization, but just as women and talking about their issues and and, and then things they've faced in society. And lesbian women actually played a vital role in the second wave of feminism. Many of the women who pioneer new feminist projects were lesbians, perhaps because their everyday lives could be easily combined with feminist separatist practices. So um, the lives, and this is uh, directly from uh, the further reading that I'll, that I'll, the, uh, the book on feminism that I've indicated in the further, further reading. Although women had lived together as couples long before the second wave, it wasn't really until the second wave of feminism in the 1970s when their lesbianism became a subject for political discussion now. So women who had previously lived their love lives in secret now made their relationships public and and they started to uh, become more proud of who they were in a way. Others who had previously lived with men also decided to share their intimate lives with women. And it was such a kind of a feminism. It was such a powerful kind of... Uh, idea or zeitgeist i guess of this time that um they started to become what was called movement lesbians so they as one popular slogan put it feminism is the theory lesbianism is the praxis sweetie praxis is like the practice so if we want to to put feminism into practice we can almost become lesbians in a way and live with women. So the movement was just so strong that there were even these movement lesbians that were um kind of starting to come out and and really exhibit what they felt was this uh, these feminist ideas um then we have the fight for autonomous pregnancy in the second wave this is the initiation of the area of my body my choice so this is following along with this personal autonomy of, of my body and in the united states the biggest landmark case was was the feminist support for roe v wade roe v wade was a class action against the abortion ban in the united states um in texas specifically so roe v wade was happening was that the u.s supreme court uh what they did was they ruled that the the constitution of the united states should protect a pregnant woman's liberty to choose and to have an abortion without government restriction. This is like the landmark case in the abort, the um, the women's right to abortion. There was also the focus on domestic violence, as we mentioned. Women wanted to put a spotlight on what was happening behind closed doors, really. And this was the second major task in, in the wave of feminist activism, uh, to really expose this violence that was not only initiated against women, but also against children, too. Testimonies shared in, in these women's centers and these consciousness raising groups planted the seeds of widespread sensitization to the fact that violence within families isn't limited to individual incidents, but represents a structural problem. In almost every city in that period, actually, feminists set up independent women's services and shelters where victims of domestic violence could take refuge without having to file bureaucratic appeals. So without getting anyone else involved, they could talk about what they were facing and they could um, kind of have some solidarity there and, and just discuss it uh, woman to woman. And this is really what this second wave of feminism initiated. There was also, as I mentioned, the idea, the third central theme of housework, care, and motherhood, the critique of the gender division of labor, how at the time, um, men were, were almost fully in charge of earning the money, and women were in charge of unpaid housework and obviously the unpaid work of raising children too. And this was a, a real issue for feminists at the time. There were, was considerable disagreement though about the way housework and childcare should ideally be structured and economically organized between the feminists. So there was a little bit of a schism there. Some feminists demanded wages for housework. Um, so money for completing housework in a way, uh, getting paid for the work you do at home which is 
um, which can be possibly overbearing at times. So this idea of wages for housework that the ensemble of unpaid cooking, cleaning, washing, and parenting that took place within households con- constituted real work was radical at the time. It was radical that, oh, housework actually is real work and women should be possibly paid for this. Others, though, demanded that housework and paid work should be distributed equally between the sexes so as not to kind of highlight women's role in housework. So let's keep it divided between the sexes and who knows their exact motivations for that. Maybe it was so that um, men could take up more of a burden for that or or even just so as not to stereotype women as, as the house workers in a way. Over the course of the debates, the putative naturalness of motherhood as women's vocation in life and the idea that their innate capacity for care started to become undermined. In the second wave of feminism, finally people started to realize, hey, Yes, maybe women are incredible at this, but this may not be their, uh, should not necessarily be their natural role possibly. And we can't just say, yeah, women care for the house and they do the labor around the house. So it, we, they started to undermine this idea that it's natural for uh, the motherhood of women is natural and women's uh, housework is, is, is a natural thing. In 1987, a group of women affiliated with the Green Party in Germany published a mother's manifesto in which they advocated basic economic security for unpaid mothers and the social valorization of housework. So it's happening in the United States. It's happening in Europe, you're seeing. And um, really incredible changes were made and still are being made to this day. But that's where the in-depth really analysis of, of feminism is is going to stop today. Because after that, I, I wasn't personally able to find books that really were able to highlight these the third wave of feminism from the 90s to 2010 and then the fourth wave of feminism to 2010s to present. That And this is in part because the movement has been a little bit more disorganized. So according to the feminist scholar, for instance, Elizabeth Evans, talking about the third wave of feminism, she says, confusing confusion, excuse me, surrounding what constitutes third wave wave feminism is in some respects its defining feature. So (laughs) the very nature of the third wave of feminism is that um, people are confused as to what constitutes the third wave of feminism. But what have been some main ideas are violence against women and reproductive rights. These are major advocacies of the third wave of feminism. Fourth wave of feminism, 2010 to present, um, fourth wave feminists have advocated for greater representation of women in politics and business, as we've seen, because we are in this fourth wave kind of currently. And they argue that society would be more equitable if policies and practices incorporated the perspectives of all people. So, what we're what a lot of the talk has been about is kind of uh, equal pay for equal labor and and to make sure that we have uh, the same amount of, of women in each position as men or or kind of things along those lines and just that equality of opportunity and, and things like this. So this is what's been happening recently and um, really an incredible movement and uh, real change kind of started to happen in the the mid 19th century around 1850 is really what I, I learned from this. And I hope you guys took uh, that away as well. Um, but it, the roots of it kind of started in antiquity and the middle ages. And um, even if just through philosophical texts and through writings and, and things like this, um, women have always had ideas about how to, uh, to achieve an equal role in society. And we still tr- strive for that today, but um, yeah, maybe there will be fifth wave and 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 so on that uh, will give us um, equal, true equality throughout the world. Um, that's something we're lacking today. Thank you for listening to this episode, everybody. Hope you guys enjoyed it. We're growing our community through word of mouth. So if you liked this episode or enjoy in-depth analysis, please share this episode with one or two people, one or two of your friends who would also enjoy it. Subscribe on whatever platform you listen or watch on. Leave a star rating or a review on Apple Podcasts or a like on YouTube. You can also share your ideas in the YouTube comments section from the Connect page on the website, insightfulthinkersmedia.com, Instagram at insightfulthinkersmedia, or Twitter at TeamITM. You can check out the poems and articles on the website. And if you want to join our monthly ITP video conference call, where we choose topics to discuss and analyze together every month, you can support the podcast on Patreon. 
whatever you guys do to support listening and watching is always plenty um thank you guys as always thank you for tuning in to the insightful thinkers podcast everybody we'll be back next monday as always for more in-depth analysis into a diverse set of topics take care everybody